Hello, I'm Sebastian Brack, the head of the Elections and Democracy Programme at the Kofi Annan Foundation and your host this afternoon. Welcome to this panel discussion on a key issue as seen from both sides of the Mediterranean. Social media are game changers for elections and democracy. The important role they played in the Arab Spring 10 years ago led to widespread perceptions they would be a historic boon for democratic empowerment. But their manipulation and weaponization in a range of referenda and elections since then has led to a dramatic reassessment of their role, and they're now widely regarded as a bane. Yet they continue to be key tools of information, mobilization, and participation in many parts of the world, especially where traditional media are controlled by the state. It is not an accident that they're regularly shut down by authoritarian regimes around election time. It was to arrive at a more nuanced understanding of social media's impact on elections and democracy, the good, the bad, and the ugly, that Kofi Annan convened a high-level commission to explore how to protect electoral integrity in the digital age. The report highlighted both the risks that social media pose, but also reminded readers of their potential benefits. Governments, tech companies, and ordinary citizens are grappling with these issues all over the world. While the need for regulation seems clear, what that regulation should look like, who should design and enforce it, and at what level are all matters of intense debate. The European Union has become something of a standard setter in the digital age, some describing it as a regulatory superpower, and it is trying to apply its technical, technical competencies in this area as well. To what extent can other parts of the world learn from their efforts? In particular, what can Africa get out of the European Union's policy debates on these issues? At the same time, what does Africa and its own experiences of social media and elections teach the EU and remind the EU of the role and importance of these media in today's democratic life? To discuss these issues today, we have four exceptionally relevant and competent speakers. First, we have Professor Divina Frau Meggs, who's from the Sorbonne Nouvelle University in Paris, but also a member of the high-level group on fake news of the European Commission. We then have um, Akuya Jechi, who is the head of the strategic response um, for the Africa area uh, at around elections at Facebook. And finally, we have, sorry, we have Ideat Hassan, who is the director of the Center for Democracy and Development in West Africa, who will be joining us shortly. And finally, Emmanuel Lubenzadio, who's head of public policy government uh, and philanthropy for Sub-Saharan Africa at Twitter. So now that you're all here with me, um, I'd like to perhaps begin by asking uh, Emmanuel um, what he sees as being specific about the African market for Twitter and social media. No, absolutely, Sebastian. Thank you very much for convening this panel. It's uh, certainly an honor to be joined by such a distinguished group of people. Um, but as it pertains to Twitter, uh, for one, Twitter is a global company. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, Af African continent is quite special. Uh, but usually, you know, when it comes to Twitter, Twitter is usually a place um, people go to to find out what's happening in the real world, right? It's timely. It's um, it's happening in real time. It's very interactive. So usually when you see things on Twitter, you know, you share, you retweet, you respond and start a conversation. It's literally like a public square where anyone can talk with everyone in real time, which, you know, make it quite special for Africa and other regions. Um, and I think, as, as, as you can see by our engagement uh, with recent developments, you know, Twitter is, is, has been known in the region, but also globally, to uh, provide people a platform to share grievances, but also share ingenuity, opportunity. You know, so this is this is very uh, it's quite special about our engagement globally, but also particularly on the African continent, right? So Twitter is special because um, and, and different people use it differently. Media companies, you have sport leagues, NGOs, journalists, and bloggers. Many content creators that we see on our platform, you know, use Twitter for a range of activities, mainly to advocate for a cause that they are very passionate about, to educate, to build a network, and even businesses. And I think particularly the business aspect is something that applies to our time, considering that everything now with the pandemic, pandemic has moved online. And we at Twitter, we want our content partners in Africa and across the globe to see us as a partner, as an enabler, right? So this gives, gives us really the opportunity to be collaborative and creative, which at the same time, Sebastian resources and incredible content experiences for people on Twitter. You know, so you've seen a lot of businesses, people uh, across the continent uh, going to Twitter, you know, to connect to our culture and to discuss trending topics that they feel strongly about, which uh, at the same time creates a very engaging audience for us to reach. Uh, and and, and Emmanuel, just, just to Emmanuel, the, question, the question is, what is, 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 there anything, is there anything specific about the African market 
for Twitter? Is there anything special about the way that it's used, the people who use it, that's different maybe in Africa than in, say, Europe or other parts of the world? Yeah, no, uh, not not certainly. You know, that, that's why Sebastian I had, I had emphasized that it's, it's a global company. Uh, but nevertheless, it's it's very refreshing to see many African leverage the power of to discuss trending topics, build brand awareness and grow businesses, um, you know, different content they're very passionate about. But this is something you definitely see across the region, and there's not a specific feature that you can really link to Twitter as a potential or African engagement, considering that we are very a global company. Um, but but one thing is definitely for sure um, that you can certainly say uh, it's it's very refreshing to see a lot of Africans sharing their own narrative, owning their narrative on Twitter. So this is definitely a feature not only unique to the African continent, but this is something we definitely take pride in enabling and providing to the African audience. So if you were to point something special, this is definitely something special that Africans bring Africa to Twitter, on Twitter, to share it with the entire world. Okay, thanks a lot. So you're referring, I think, to that to the disintermediation that the, these tools allow ordinary people to put their own voices out there and increases, I suppose, um, individual Africans' voice in in the global ether. Um, Kuya, can you want you want to complement that with any uh, information from Facebook's point of view? Have you guys done any specific studies to tr try and understand the specificities of the African market? Perfect way, I think. Similarly uh, to, to what Emmanuel said, Facebook is a global company. Um, if you look specifically in the Sub-Saharan African context, I think all of the related issues that we're thinking about when it comes to global elections, we also think about in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I think as we do everywhere around the, the, the globe though, sort of Facebook doesn't operate in isolation. So everything that we do, no matter if it's combating misinformation or thinking about how to keep people safe from harassment or how to make their voices heard in an upcoming election. It's all about partnerships with people in the respective countries that we're, we're operating in. So I think that on the one hand, just as Emmanuel said, um, Sub-Saharan Africa is not unique, but I do think that we have the um, realization that we have to be, so we can take solutions created in Silicon Valley and just plop them into a country and say, here you go. I think part of our role and responsibility to better understand um, for example, election risk is to meet the relevant stakeholders, um, have open and honest conversations with them, and better understand what are they concerned about um, for any regarding for any upcoming election or, or civic event that might take place in their country. And I think specifically for Sub-Saharan Africa, this year alone, there are 13 national elections happening across the continent. In addition, you have municipal elections, you have a potential um, referendum in Kenya, um, other unprecedented events we yet not know about, and it's all happening in the context of sort of COVID looming in the background. So I think one size does not fit all. Um, and so better understanding how can we support Ethiopian elections or what's happening in Bana, um, I think are, are sort of a way that makes us unique because we recognize we, we can do it by ourselves. That, I mean, linked to my previous question as well, are there any specific vulnerabilities about the digital environment in, on the continent? I think, to be honest, from what I've seen, and, and I've been with Facebook now for five years, first as part of our Africa public policy team, and now sort of working as part of our strategic response team focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa alone. Um, alone, when I say that, it's still a lot of countries. <laughs> but I do think that uh, when it comes to the respective risks that we measure, uh, we do try to figure out, okay, when it comes to, let's say, hate speech, how does it present itself? Is it happening in different in different languages? Who's talking to whom and what way? Um, and, and how can we address that? Um, I'm usually talking often about digital literacy. That's not unique to Sub-Saharan Africa, but how do, we, how do we make sure that people know how to behave themselves online in terms of how to share information or not share information? How can they not be part of sort of the misinformation um, going viral, for example. Um, but I, I always like to use the example that my family is all over the world. I have family in Ghana, I have family in the US, I have family in, in, in Europe. And so however we connect is, is a good reflection of how, how Facebook works. So if you have a misinformation problem in Ghana, you're also going to have it in Europe, you're also going to have it in the US because we're all connected. I think it's it's difficult to say, oh, we only see this issue in Sub-Saharan Africa because that's not how the the online world works. We're all interconnected. Um, I think the 
the bigger part is, and this is why this panel is so fantastic, is how can we learn from each other and sort of address some of the issues, the common issues we have, be that um, supporting digital literacy or tackling virality or making sure that um, so political ads are transparent online. We know who's spending money and what they're saying and where they're coming from. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to single out Africa to sort of have unique issues from the rest of the world. I think we just need to sort of focus on tackling them together. Thanks, Akuya. Um, I, was, I thought perhaps you'd give us a different readout because I imagine that the level of internet penetration um, in Africa is not the same. It also varies a great deal uh, from country to country between the urban and the rural environments. Um, and so uh, that, I think that's specific in the sense that you have probably higher concentrations of users in, in big cities. Um, the report, the Kofi Annan report, identified three areas which led countries to be more or less vulnerable um, to social media weaponization. The first was having a, a very a divided uh, society along regional, ethnic, or, or uh, religious lines. Secondly, um, having highly politicized media. And thirdly, low trust in institutions. And I thought that these vulnerabilities would be uh, particularly uh, marked in some countries. Um, maybe you can address some of those points before we move to the next question. Yeah, sure. I think um, you, you bring up a good point in that the number of uh, internet or social media numbers, even though lower across Southern Africa, it belies a little bit of the impact that we have seen because what people sometimes share on social media is sort of taken without it further being verified and shared on traditional media. So we have seen those trends. Um, I do think to the point, the three points that you raised, um, dealing with political divided societies is something that simply fits into what I spoke about earlier, understanding the historical context of each country where an election is taking place to better understand how does hate speech might uh, materialize online? Um, what, is, what is the history behind different people? Who has been in charge before? Who's trying to maybe get to power now? Uh, is there a likelihood of a peaceful transition on have we seen election violence taking place in the past? Um, but as we've seen what happened recently in the US, and what happened in the capital, I, I again think it's not unique to Sub-Saharan Africa. I think yeah. one just has to be really aware of um, what are potential risks, high risk, medium or low, and then address them accordingly. I think the same is, can be said about low trust in constitutions. Um, you have people all over the world who, who don't believe <laughs> what their government is saying. Um, I think, but the unique thing about social media is that it has democratized the space. We have more people who are opposition candidates or um, dissidents or even people sitting in a diaspora now taking place and, and participating in a conversation that previously was limited only to the people in power uh, and people who maybe have control over the airwaves, be that traditional radio, television, um, or, or newsprint. So, um, yeah, these are important issues to take into account, but I, I wouldn't want to overgeneralize and say it's only an African problem. Oh. Okay, so the report actually looked at this and it identified that among established democracies, America was particularly vulnerable because it actually meets these three criteria more than, say, for example, more, most Northern European countries. So it's not a particularly African thing. Each society um, scores differently according to these three different vulnerabilities. Um, but I think many countries um, in Africa are vulnerable because of those three uh, criteria. But um, another question I had, because I think a lot, some of the viewers are probably from Europe and don't know Africa very well, to understand the sheer size and variety of Africa. Um, in Europe, we always complain we have 28 languages to deal with, but I think in Africa, there's something like 2,000 different languages. And I'm wondering, on Twitter and Facebook, um, how many languages are being used on your platforms, and how can you possibly try and uh, monitor all these different languages? Do you want Emmanuel to go first, or is that for me? <laughs> sure, sure, hey, to give you a break, <laughs> to give you a break. <laughs> No, <clears throat> obviously, you know, as I said, Sebastian, we are we are a global company. Uh, but then, when it comes to events such as elections, right, which which are quite prominent, and there's there's also uh, any kind of development or emergence of potential hate speech, uh, we take a, we we take a contextual approach, right? So we obviously have people uh, in terms of moderation that are proficient in some of the respective languages but also very much proficient of the cultural context, you know, in order to provide the kind of assessment 
the kind of action in order to prevent the spread of either misinformation or hate speech. So this is something it's, it's very much strongly considered and it's part of our uh, election efforts towards election integrity, right? Because obviously the health of the public conversation is something that we hold dear at Twitter. And so in order for us to enable a healthy environment for speech to be uh, free and open, uh, we would like to, we, we are very strong on protecting the, the, the conversation of the speech. So as such to really, again, sum up and answer your question quite, quite, uh, quite uh, fast or quickly. Yes, we have people who are very much knowledgeable about the contextual context and also in terms of language proficiency as well. But during elections, we, we put a specific emphasis to assessments uh, by people who are very qualified and about the, both language and cultural context who then uh, action certain decisions. So there's, there's at least how we address it from our end. Thanks, Manuel. I gave Akuya a little break to collect her thoughts. Go ahead, Akuya. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so we, similar as, as Twitter does, we have um, a set of rules and call them community standards. They're global, um, but you're completely right that based on people speaking different languages all around the world, um, we as Facebook had to sort of increase the sheer size of, of people working on online safety and security, as well as sort of speaking these languages so that if people report content that they believe violates these community standards, um, people could review that content and, and then if it does take it down. I think um, one has to clarify though that we, we cannot monitor what people are saying in that regard because of the sheer size of, of users and people communicating across the board. That being said, again, what I mentioned before, having the historical and cultural context about different hotspots around the globe, um, we have sort of made investment based on oh, we know that there is a high likelihood that hate speech is going to spike in this country because they have an election. Do we have people who speak the top three languages in this in this country represented at Facebook so that when context does come in, um, content does come in, we can review it. I think um, you could never hire people who speak all languages around the world. <laughs> I don't think any company ever has. Um, but, but we do recognize that sometimes people speak languages or dialects. Um, and sometimes they speak it online, but sometimes they don't, right? It's actually quite surprising sometimes when I ask my colleagues, oh, what do we see? What language are being spoken? That usually it is usually one, two or three top languages in a country, generally speaking, not everywhere. And that then informs our hiring um, to make sure that we have that capacity as well. But interestingly, I've also learned recently that a lot of the content that we do review and take down is language agnostic, right? It's, it's basically based on behavior what people are, are posting, be that um, spam stuff or, or potentially misinformation. Oftentimes our systems and our AI can pick it up because of the behavior behind it. And it actually only in few cases requires somebody who have language ability to, to uh, further review it. Um, so our systems are quite sophisticated in many ways, not perfect by any chance, but, but people have invested a lot of time and effort and we've hired over 35,000 people just focused on online safety and security alone um, to make sure that we get had a lot of the, the bad stuff that's online. Okay, thanks a lot, Kuya. And we'll come back to the question of how AI um, can help or, or weaponize uh, social media or also help to put down content, um, problematic content quickly. Let me uh, switch over now to uh, Professor Frau Meggs who besides being a professor is also an advisor uh, to a variety of institutions, including the European Union. And as I said in my introductory remarks, he's part of the high level uh, group uh, working on disinformation uh, for the European Union. And she's also a, spe a specialist on digital um, literacy. So I think she has an interesting perspective. And what I'd like Professor Meggs to tell us about is um, the European Union's efforts to grapple with these uh, problems, in particular through its uh, Digital Services Act and the Human Rights and Democracy Action Plan, which are in the works right now, for us to tell us a bit more about what, how the EU is trying to grapple with these uh, challenges uh, posed by social media in elections. Um, Hello, Professor. Uh, thank you, first, Sebastian. Thank you for, for receiving me uh, in the Coffee Annan Foundation, even though it's at a distance. Um, it's an honor, uh, considering, as you say, that uh, 
behind you, you have two of uh, probably the, the wisest people we've had in the 20th century. And um, their passing uh, is, um, is a misfortune, I think. But let's hope that we'll have young people uh, picking up on that. Um, I've been listening carefully to what Facebook and Twitter were saying and thinking, um, um, well, I, I should go back to how we thought about these things uh, in Europe, uh, because it happened a little bit earlier than in Africa. I think it, it came to everybody as a shock that the social media would um, be weaponized the way they have been. And so we had to um, sort of uh, make a kind of diagnosis first, even as, as researchers and, and uh, politicians, um, uh, and uh, pay attention to uh, um, what um, fake news in particular were about. First, we thought it was um, disseminated people's uh, attitude, etc. And little by little, we came to the realization that uh, uh, there was um, uh, structured uh, political attempts at manipulating and disinforming a population, that uh, uh, there were coordinated behaviors, uh, inauthentic behaviors, um, uh, going on, people passing off as somebody else, uh, countries passing off um, as uh, being into some other countries. Um, uh, and that, in fact, uh, it was a kind of, uh, without going into plot theory, <laughs> um, uh, rabbit hole, but uh, there was this feeling uh, that there was um, uh, some attack uh, against uh, the process of uh, democratic consolidation of the EU, which is, you know, is still going on. But I think Africa could read it the same way. Uh, so. Um, this uh, uh, fight, so this, this attempt at destructing uh, any uh, uh, institutions uh, that um, uh, claimed uh, to, to push for democracy uh, was uh, stressing for, for us in Europe as we were coming up with integrity, uh, clearly was uh, the target. Uh, and so we had also to look at our vulnerabilities, uh, to go back on what you were mentioning, Sebastian. and. Um, we uh, had uh, more or less the ones you said, uh, lower and lower trust in institutions that didn't start with social media, but uh, uh, was um, reverberated and amplified by, by social media. Um, uh, more or less dependent media, you know, we have uh, post-communist countries that are still budding in their different uh, media structures. And uh, we had uh, minorities coming from other countries uh, that can, could be uh, also weaponized. Um, and create a polarization, which is uh, the biggest impact uh, visible of uh, um, this information. And of course, uh, we being Europe, uh, we had a proximity with Russia uh, and a very active uh, Russia in terms of hybrid threats and uh, um, uh, trying to uh, affect national uh, elections in, uh, in other countries, especially uh, Nordic countries and uh, post-communist countries. Occurring uh, polarization, in particular uh, nationalistic nostalgia, uh, with two or three themes always, and one particular to Europe, uh, which was the connected, uh, uh, explosive uh, uh, um, uh, concatenation of religion and migrants, and migrants being uh, uh, really uh, pointed at uh, uh, some of the most dangerous populations. So we uh, found ourselves. Uh, uh, called, summoned up, um, and it's the first step uh, in 2017-18 uh, uh, by the task force that was created uh, on this information. And our first strategy uh, was to uh, realize that we were part of the Brussels effect, as it's called, which is to say that decision we would take, any elements, any solutions we would propose would be watched by other countries. We were not so much worried about Africa as um, uh, non-democratic countries that were close to and that had a vested interest in this information, like, uh, Iran, etc. So um, these, are, these were the things we were dealing with, and Turkey, I was missing Turkey, that was changing at the time. So we knew that we could not go towards hard regulation. Uh, that that would uh, really play in the hands of non-democratic countries because they could claim censorship and that we were activating censorship against the platforms and therefore we were not being democratic ourselves. So we did what we always do in democracies, which was let's have self-regulation by the platforms first. And so our first um, uh, goal was to create a, 
uh, with the platforms because they were with us, uh, Twitter, Facebook, all of them were convened uh, uh, in the EU, uh, in Brussels, and uh, we um, uh, tried to put a plan of action together uh, with ethical guidelines that they would have and they would agreed to follow, uh, specifically during election times, because as, as you were saying, um, what happens in uh, other times is not as important, but uh, in democratic uh, societies, of course, elections are the most mobilizing moment, and in fact, the most vulnerable moment also. So um, uh, they agreed uh, to reporting uh, and to giving access to uh, their archives and their library of archives um, so that we could find out, whoever wanted, could find out uh, who financed uh, political ads during the three months uh, coming up to elections. So uh, for us, that was a, a compromise solution, uh, an idea that there would be uh, more and more transparency and uh, loyalty, we call it, of, of the platforms uh, to this uh, democratic process. And they agreed. Uh, and we set up a, a watchers group, uh, which is to say that we didn't just let them go back and do whatever they wanted. Uh, we've been monitoring uh, this with um, uh, monthly uh, reports, and then uh, a yearly report by ERGA, which is uh, uh, for us the competent platform to uh, pay attention to these issues, which is to say... Could you just repeat that? ERGA I've, I've also, what does it stand for? Yeah. Yes, ERGA is uh, our uh, European um, authority for audiovisual media services authorities. Okay, so because in fact the platforms uh, under our system more or less fall back under the authority of uh, uh, existing media authorities. It so happens that uh, Africa has the same thing, uh, which is uh, maybe already pointing at some kind of solution for Africa. Uh, they organized, uh, all the um, media authorities are organized in Africa uh, around uh, several HITAS uh, and, uh, and um, uh, REFRAM, which is uh, another um, a body in, in Africa that watches uh, uh, the, the, the media. So, in a way, we were establishing two uh, relevant uh, authorities, uh, election committees, which happen in each country, uh, and to which actually Facebook and Twitter, and with which they work, and they all have shields uh, for elections. I'm not going to go into that. Facebook uh, probably will speak about it better, and Google has one too. Um, so where they deal directly with these authorities. Um, but we also wanted to deal with the media authorities, so that uh, we um, we didn't um, push uh, too much from the perspective of uh, top-down uh, political um, um, application. And we let some fluidity because these agencies are more or less autonomous according to the country you're talking to. So that was the first step. And we're still in this step and we're still in valuation process. And in the meantime, we knew that, of course, the Digital Services Act was being taking place. I privacy we have this on at the moment, uh, including the Human Rights uh, Initiative uh, and also the Digital for Development Initiative. And so uh, we knew that there were concerted efforts. Um, what's interesting is, again, uh, as you were saying earlier, not one solution fits all. And uh, I think we have to be careful that uh, not all media, social media platforms are the same uh, and they don't fulfill the same um, uh, solutions and so uh, that, that's uh, also something we were being careful about. If I speak now about the Digital Services Act that is being still discussed, um, what we see is that uh, we are maintaining uh, the, the status of the platforms as uh, decided by the Americans and this is the, the, the elephant um, in the room, the United States and their legislation and their regulation. And so we might want to speak uh, to speak about that at some point, huh? uh, but which is to say that they have limited responsibility. You know, they they have notice and take down, and that's about it. Uh, and even though America seems to be wanting to go further now because they've had the capital riot uh, in Europe for the moment, we're not um, going further. Huh? Uh, but uh, we ask them to intensify. Uh, their fight against uh, illegal content on the internet um, with uh, more and more um, uh, constraints, especially for what we call the very big platforms, um, the ones that have uh, uh, more than 10% um, uh, that reach um, um, more than 10% of the European population. 
basically the GAFAMs, uh, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, etc. Uh, because uh, uh, the risks are not just dissemination for us, um, uh, the risks are amplification of uh, these, um, these behaviors. Um, so they are going to have to put in place tools for flagging uh, illicit content. Some countries, uh, I can, back, can come back to that if you want later, have already taken national laws, uh, but right now I'm just thinking, uh, talking about the EU uh, level. Uh, to mitigate some of these uh, constraints, uh, the law is also planning to uh, designate uh, uh, moderators of trust, and like third party uh, moderators, uh, which is to say um, not the ones that are employed by Twitter, Facebook, etc., but outside ones that uh, have prior priority when they flag. For instance, uh, uh, um, in speech. Um, uh, would give, be given something compared to one individual flagging something, if you see what I mean, uh, the, the kind of um, mechanism we're trying to put in place. Um, and also, uh, so that there is no uh, um, denunciation of uh, censorship, um, uh, the, the law is going to uh, uh, leave uh, appeals possibilities for uh, users whose content uh, would have been deplatformed by the moderators of the platforms. Um, so. Uh, uh, that's uh, the, the package a little bit, um, and there is this transparency of algorithms uh, that we are asking for in the cases of uh, micro-targeting political campaign ads, um, uh, and uh, that's about it in a nutshell uh, for for us uh, in the EU. Well, I hope thank I you very much. Here. Thank you, Professor. I think it's very clear. Um, I let you speak a bit longer because, as you said, you're the only representative of the European side of the of the Mediterranean, <laughs> and I think what you said was extremely interesting and informative. Um, I'm, I'm wondering now to what extent similar exercises are taking place on the continent. Perhaps you can tell us about whether you're doing similar th work with governments in Africa or maybe even in the African Union as a whole. To what extent are these discussions with the tech companies uh, taking place? Um, here, maybe I'm opening up the floor to um, Akuya, Manuel. Don't all speak at the same time, please. <laughs> well, if I want, maybe I can introduce a little bit because there, nobody is there from Northern Africa, and I do work with Northern Africa. Uh, and uh, with Northern Africa, we uh, we've talked mostly to, with Tunisia. Uh, that is but, but, uh, very I'm wondering. I'm wondering, given that yes. the, we have two people here working who represent yes. actually yes. the two major social media companies yes. uh, on the continent. Let's, let's Perhaps you can yes. give us a bit of uh, some examples of the work that you may be doing in Africa with African governments or the AU. Can you be? Can you maybe help us clarify the question just a little bit? Because of okay, course, I'm sorry. Our I'm work, sorry. of course, involves. Um, working with governments, electoral commissions, civil society organizations, and of course these topics, could be that from regulation or sort of how do we tackle some of these issues we discussed come up. But um, as you rightly pointed out in the beginning, we're talking about 50 plus countries and, and conversations in different places are different. So um, we wanna be sure to really answer your question. Could you help us understand what conversations you're, you're referring to? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. What I meant is that um, Professor Meggs explained the kind of regulatory process which is taking place, which is based on consultation uh, with the tech companies, uh, with uh, fact checkers, et cetera, to try and find uh, an intelligent way of regulating um, social media, and also in a democratic way. I think that not many of us know or understand uh, what's going on in a similar capacity on the African continent. I know some countries have, have implemented um, regulations, sometimes quite draconian. Um, to what extent have the media, have the tech companies that you are been involved in those uh, regulations, those laws? And are there such discussions taking place at the African Union level? Okay, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at, at the conversation and at that question and then hand it over to Emmanuel. Um, I think there are definitely conversations happening in regards to different regulations to tackle issues, be that hate speech or misinformation. Um, I think oftentimes it's also very much understood why governments want to better regulate that. I think uh, to the point of whether or not they involved us, some of these conversations are of course taking place behind closed doors and I would be amiss to share, share the content of those conversations here. 
Um, and, and every time we are approached, we're very much interested in being part of the conversation to better think about unintended consequences. Because as well-meaning as some of these regulations might be, I think oftentimes putting requirements for takedowns within a certain time period or, or other requirements that I've seen in, in other European countries are, are difficult to implement in practice. Um, so I think that every time we are approached um, to sort of further explain how our platforms work or how do we do our work behind the scenes to tackle issues of hate speech or fake accounts or, or anything else that they might be concerned about, we're always available and, and happy to have these conversations. Um, but I do think that it's important. I think regulation per se is a good thing. I'm a lawyer by way of background, and, and I think regulation definitely always has its place. I do still think that copy pasting from sort of the European approach into the Sub-Saharan Africa environment isn't always quite um, fitting. Um, because I, I oftentimes think it also depends on how engaged is the media, how engaged are civil society organizations, who else is part of the conversation, and how do you hold people responsible to doing certain things or not doing certain things. And I know there have been conversations, for example, in, um, in India in regards to how do we trace back to the original sender of a message on WhatsApp, for example. Um, on the one hand, you can understand why people would want to know who's behind a viral piece of content, but on the other hand, what does that really get us, right? Shouldn't we be taking a step back and thinking more about how do we educate people about the consequences of sharing information they maybe not have had the chance to check on their own before in terms of whether it's true or not? Because oftentimes you've seen that people share information because they want to help, right? They want to share information because they think maybe this is true and uh, I, I want to make sure my family and friends are safe. And so just sort of, yes, you, you want to, tackle these issues, but simply by making the person who originally sent this message accountable, you might not actually accomplish that. So I went a little bit off your question as well, but I do think that um, it, it's, it's something where we would love to be part of the conversations, often we are, and I do think more, more can be done for us to have these conversations going forward. Thank you, Kuya. Yeah. And I'd like to bring in another person we haven't heard from yet, uh, Ideyat Hassan. Um, Maybe she can put a camera on so we can see Idayat Hassan, who's joining us from Abuja. Idayat, are you with us? Uh, yes, please. Hi. Um, okay, so we don't have the, the privilege of seeing you, but I uh, presume that uh, you, can, you can hear me. Um, you represent, you're the director of the Center for Democratic Development in West Africa. And so in, in this discussion, you represent in many ways uh, African civil society, and I'm wondering how you feel about these African attempts so far, especially in West Africa, which is the region that you know best, to regulate social media. Um, do you think that they will bring improvements in terms of the abuse of social media and the dissemination of hate speech um, around election time, or are you concerned that they may also be instrumentalized to, uh, to let's say, uh, restrict the ability of social civil society like yours to do its work and, and express itself. How do you feel about these regulatory efforts underway in West Africa? Can you generalize or is each country extremely different? Yeah, oh, thank you very much, um, Sebastian. Importantly, on the last question, how Quat attempted to answer, it's important to note that there is no broad African response in terms of addressing this at the continental level, and of course at the ECOWAS level, West Africa, where I work, we are just starting the discussion in terms of how to engage, uh, especially as it relates to elections. But fortunately, the last sitting of the African Commission actually made reference in its resolution to the danger posed by AI, internet disinformation, and the need for it to actually be addressed. So I guess the discussion is actually beginning um, is beginning on the continent now. Now, what is very important to note is that the response to disinformation and influence oppression in, on the continent is being limited to a host of very draconi draconian intervention. One, and very important one, is regulation. And this, of course, does not relate with the reality on ground. Afrobarometer, for instance, polled in 2019, and from their polling, they actually showed that only 34% of citizens in the nine countries polled had 
are in support of social media regulation based on the mm -hmm. fact that information shared online is capable of dividing the country. In Nigeria also, the CDD in its report on driving disinformation and discontent spoke to Nigerians and they were generally of the opinion that any attempt to actually regulate the media will eventually, social media, will eventually lead to the stifling of voices um, in part. And that is the general feeling on the continent because this time around, social media and digital platform has given opportunity to people to connect with their neighbor at a cheaper cost, to hold government to account, to organize protests, and even to participate in elections in spite, in spite of some of the disadvantages. But the government response at no point in time has been the same way. It's always social media regulation across the continent, several countries. So you find, for instance, in Nigeria, the introduction of the social media uh, legislation, a bill, and that bill is being resuscitated following the NSAS protest. Such a bill will not only decriminalize voices and the work of organizations like ours at the CDD, but any violation we entail you going to the to jail for up to three years and the likely and the payment of more than twenty thousand US dollars fine. In Lesotho, I think they had a pro a proposition that if you have a hundred followers, you must actually register with the communication authority. In Tanzania, we have seen a colleague lawyer who was not only sent out of our firm but also disbarred for practicing political activism. The numbers of countries involved in this are just so very, very much. I think at this point in time, there are more than 20 African countries that are exploiting the way of regulation in terms of addressing disinformation, hate speech, and foreign influence through different ways, really. But beyond that, with the issue of regulation, what is also important to note is that most of this regulation just infringes on human rights, even at times socioeconomic rights of the people. But <clears throat> it goes beyond it goes it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. It is important to put out that internet shutdown is become so weaponized during elections, protests referendum and any form of participatory citizens participation mechanisms on the continent and the most recent example of internet shutdown during elections will just be from last sunday with the congo brazzaville elections about. where <clears throat> internet telephone and everything was completely cut was completely cut off so ethiopia togo Togo, uh, Cameroon. Somalia, uh, Cameroon, and all Chad. In fact, Chad was for up to 16 months, and the forthcoming elections is likely to also be affected by that. This year, we've seen Uganda go through that. Senegal is also gone through the same thing. They've had this shutdown of internet in order so that citizens cannot organize. Yeah. protest or communicate during elections with attendant social economic challenges attached to it. The social economic cost is actually on an underexplored, as in the government are really at no point in time interested in the social economic um, costs of shutting down the internet itself, because it's more or less seen from a public order or security perspective. And even the forthcoming Benin elections in West Africa in on April 11th might actually experience that because it's very instructive that Benin had to go ahead and start talking about the social media tax law. But for us in West Africa, it's also important to note that when Togo shut down the internet during the 2017 um protest and discourse around constitutional reform or change, the ECOWAS court gave a judgment in favor 
of the petitioner and against the Togolese government. So I think public interest lawyering is also being able to help in that dimension with the ECOWAS court playing a very useful uh, role in this dimension. Another very important point that must be pointed out is that as against the proposal in the EU, where they are talking in terms of a, a, a plan on democracy or, and digital services that will protect not just the citizens, but the media platform and journalists. Here on the continent, you find that at every point in time, if there are not outright blockage of sites like this um, people's, uh, people's Galaxy or something in Nigeria where you can't ad access the platform, because it's so critical of the government, journalists are attacked and even individual. During the NSAS protest, just for tweeting in support of NSAS, Animole Ayo was detained for 40 days here in Nigeria without being brought to court to face judgment. The same has happened during elections that once you tweet, Wherever you are during the Kogi State local, uh, local governorship elections here in Nigeria, as people were tweeting and posting on Facebook, political talks were deployed to beat up such, pe such people for, esp uh, for espousing anti-government or anti-political party sentiment. The same goes for people even at the state level. So these are very important. But what is also important to it, note that it, at it, 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 can we come back to you maybe in the discussion? I think you've made a very, very eloquent, um, I think, uh, plea for the importance of um, social media freedom and how in Africa, I think this is true of my experience as well, many people don't see social media as the main threat to democracy as they do in, in parts of Europe and America. They see actually the restriction of social media and the over-regulation or political regulation of social media as a bigger threat. And you've mentioned also the importance of internet shutdowns and social media shutdowns. And this is a question I think many people are interested in because in Western Europe, the dominant discourse is that basically uh, social media companies are too powerful and uh, you're weaponizing and, and uh, controlling our democracies. But in Africa, uh, they, we, citizens see that internet and social media shut down uh, almost now quite systematically around election time. And so we're wondering, what do social media companies do in reaction to such draconian measures? But before you answer, I also want to encourage viewers to send in their questions now so that at the end of the discussion, we can also take some um, audience questions. But the question that I have for the tech companies is, what, what, what do you do when you're faced with this? Um, do you have a dialogue with the government? And what position do you have on these uh, increasingly common uh, shutdowns? Since Aku has already spoken, maybe I could just uh, briefly uh, jump in, Sebastian. I think it's, it's definitely worrisome to see a growing trend, you know, towards regulatory action that could see instances of internet shutdown increase further. Uh, but as it pertains to how do we how do we address those uh, occurrences, look, Sebastian, it's, it's, it's always a, a matter of uh, having a conversation and to do some explaining. And and I, and I think this this doesn't only apply to sub-Saharan Africa, but it also may also apply to other regions, right? So oftentimes there's a lack of understanding how social media works, right? So uh, so oftentimes it just takes some explaining uh, with the whole. Um, to avoid some draconian regulation or internet shutdowns to actually show uh, governments, because oftentimes the, the debate on national security is often provided and forwarded as a, as, 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 as a, in response to internet shutdowns or to justify internet shutdowns. But I think it's, it's at least from, from our end, it's all, always a matter of having discussions to actually explain how Twitter or social media general works, the policies that we have in place in order to protect uh, the public conversation you know, different kind of measures also to show um, that we have a trust and safety council in place that includes different civil society organizations that for one pose critical questions and also help us update our policy so that it really fits to the context on the ground. So I think a lot of times, Sebastian, uh, if a government imposes or introduces a law, we are companies, right? We are not in a place to, to introduce an, another legislation that may counter this. But I think one thing that we can do on our part, Sebastian, is definitely do some explaining, you know, engage in conversations with the hope that this may, as opposed to leading to internet shutdowns, which then 
prevents free speech from happening, uh, but at least engaging the conversation to show, to, to really strike a balance between protecting speech, but at the same time ensuring that innovation can still happen. You know, so again, it's a lot of times it's about explaining, it's about uh, 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 proposing different kind of initiatives, for instance, showing that we have partnership with UNESCO or media literacy, showing that we have different organizations that we are working with. And I think this pandemic, Sebastian, has actually shown the importance, why it's important for social media companies to cooperate, right? We have created prompts that encourage people to read before they tweet. Different kind of initiatives that encourage media literacy, to encourage uh, uh, preventing hate speech. So for one, it's a, it's a discussion, Sebastian, but I think it's, it's really also shown um, that we're willing to engage, but also the, the value proposition that social media brings in actually informing population and encouraging dialogue. And I think oftentimes that doesn't happen uh, and not so much on, your, on the government side, but I think there's a lack of trust and lack of knowledge and also acknowledging the fact that we have a shared responsibility. Oftentimes, social media gets blamed, but we don't blame other institutions, right? So education needs to be, be play a better part. Media literacy needs to play a part. And, and I think this is something that needs to be emphasized more, that it's a matter of collaboration coming together because nothing can, can be, nothing substantial can be achieved in isolation, as who has pointed out. And I think this pandemic has shown it its best, right? The amount of partnership that we have engaged with the WHO, uh, the initiatives, the prompts, the activations. Look, this is actually great, you know, that shows that, look, we are in this together. And I think social misinformation, hate speech, these issues need to be tackled from a holistic point of view, as opposed to introducing regulation, hoping that it will just beam away the problem. Thanks, Emmanuel. If you do want to compliment, um... And I, I, by compliment, I don't mean to say how eloquent he was, but rather fill in any blanks you might still see after Emmanuel's answer. He was very eloquent, but yes, I would like to add <laughs> to, to what Bobby Emmanuel and Ida had said. Um, I think I will only want to say plus one in regards to having the conversations, and it oftentimes starts with listening and learning, so rather than coming in and sort of saying, shutdowns are bad for your country, there's an economic cost to them, which there is, of course, I think it helps better understand what are the real concerns. So I do think that sometimes governments are overwhelmed with what they see online, be that hate speech or be that other content and sort of incitement to violence related content. And, and just as Emmanuel said, not quite knowing how to engage or who to talk to, the only solution they see is to turn it all off. So having part of these initial conversations and, and for us to actually listen to what their concerns are and then explain that how we are operating and what we're doing in regards to some of these things they're concerned about, and validly so, I think that can sometimes address concerns that they might have, be that hate speech or misinformation and the like. Because usually when I, um, when we used to travel before the pandemic, um, I would be one of the first per people from Facebook any sort of government official would have ever met. So they will say, oh, queer, I didn't even know there are real people at Facebook. I didn't even know there were Africans at Facebook. And then they would say, let me tell you honestly what, what I'm really concerned about when it comes to the platform. So having these honest and open conversations to really get behind why these shutdowns might be happening, I think have been tremendously helpful. But um, Idiad also pointed out very truthfully that sometimes despite of these engagements, not every government has good intentions when it comes to shutdown. And they might just put a reason out there such as security or safety um, but the reality is they just want to shut down dissident and opposition candidates. They don't want people to use social media to showcase police brutality or um, to hold their governments accountable. So I think one has to differentiate between what type of shutdown is it, what type of government can we communicate and actually discuss the real costs of shutdowns, can we communicate and sort of together uh, address issues that are of real concern, or is it I wouldn't say a lost cause, but or is it sort of just a front where um, we can't really tell the government what to do? Uh, I think we just have to uh, sort of be ready when, when they're ready to, to engage again. Thank you very much, uh, Akuya. Yeah, P P Professor Megs, I was actually coming to you anyway, but um, before, I mean, before you weigh in, I'm just curious to hear your explanation of this difference of perspectives 
between um, Africa and Europe, because I find that in Europe, we mainly see social media now as a threat, and it's this all these all-powerful companies that are distorting our, our democracies. Whereas in Africa, I, my sentiments also from having lived and worked there is that it's the other way around, actually, that um, people are more concerned about, um, you know, um, excessive regulation, uh, state internet shutdowns, and social media is seen as, as still liberating tools. I'm wondering, what, what, how do you explain that? And, and perhaps you also get your feedback on the conversations we've just had. Well, I don't have a, a, a true, an all answer, except uh, I would say that uh, uh, we have different ways of understanding democracy and uh, uh, different maturity in terms of democracy. Uh, in Europe, we are old democracies, and uh, uh, the, the party process and the, the way we uh, can express dissent, etc., is um, very uh, uh, fluid in a way. Huh? Uh, which is why uh, polarization was uh, interesting when there was foreign interference, because we really felt that our fluid process was threatened. Whereas in Africa, without wanting to be uh, 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 having a sort of superiority process, you are in many ways um, reinventing your democracies uh, regularly and uh, and using the social media as part of that. We are not banging on the social media just for the sake of it, and they are very present otherwise. Uh, but, but I wanted to um, come back to uh, um, the situation in Europe, but also um, what uh, was said by Emmanuel and Akuya. Uh, all these things you've been describing that Facebook and Twitter are doing, it's because we've put pressure on you. Social, uh, civil society, governments in Europe have been putting pressure on you. You were not talking about media literacy even a year ago. Uh, you're still not accepting fact checkers, you Twitter at the moment, huh? because you consider that you have enough journalists on your, on, among your members and huh? to, uh, to uh, have fact checking happen. Facebook, um, same, huh? is supporting a certain amount of fact checking groups, huh? uh, but if uh, they don't have the IFCN uh, certification of approval, uh, they're not uh, supported. And guess what? Most media in America, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa are not approved by the IFCN, which is to say the International Network of Fact Checkers. And so um, uh, we have been pushing in Europe for regulation, but you've understood that for us it's the last recourse, huh? the last solution. Huh? We've been pushing, on the other hand, and inventing several forms of self-regulation, the, 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 the ethical guidelines that the platforms are accepting, fact-checking, which is to say the journalists uh, themselves uh, as independent bodies uh, or dependent, but mostly independent bodies doing it. And then a lot of media literacy initiative that I happen to be spearheading in Europe and uh, at UNESCO for a long time. But you know what? We had to create a directive, a directive on uh, audiovisual media services uh, in Europe, where we have put media literacy as an obligation of the member states and an obligation for the platforms to carry it and to promote it. So yes, the conversation is taking place, but uh, there, uh, there had to be a huge risk to democracy for the platforms to at last start listening. Professor Max, no, thank you very much for this. How nice. <laughs> thank How you for nice. this passionate Let's keep on. intervention. I was going to actually now open up the floor to questions from the audience, but I think that um, Akuya uh, wants to react to that because, of course, I think Professor Megs, I think you deserve to, to have a chance to react to that uh, intervention. Go ahead, Akuya. Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to sort of set the record straight when it comes to media literacy and digital, sort of digital literacy as well. Um, online safety has been part of the conversation since day one of me doing this job for, for Facebook at, at, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I know that so well because I used to be the one behind the scenes doing the hacky work of helping NGOs put these online safety campaigns together and, and sort of help them with advertisement credits so they could reach more people for free about their sort of online safety and media literacy campaigns. I do think that, of course, having these conversations and exploring the why these these um, interventions are important and why our companies have a responsibility are always helpful and are always welcome. But I just wanted to say that, at least in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's the only region I can speak to, these sort of issues and, and um, cam campaigns to support online safety and digital literacy have been part of the conversation since day one. I think the other part about partnerships that I just wanted to further explain is that one of the big issues also in a lot of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is like, yes, on the one hand, of course, we cannot do this work without our partners, but it's not that straightforward. 
um, NGOs these days sometimes have local affiliation. Um, sometimes they have certain biases as well. So we have to tread carefully if we want to engage with everybody in a way that is both transparent and doesn't, um, out of sheer ignorance, sort of support one voice over another. So um, when we engage, it doesn't matter if it's with civil society organizations, with the government, with uh, government stakeholders, I think we have to be really careful about, yes, we want more people to be part of the conversation, but we don't inadvertently want to give um, the, the, the ruling party more power or more voice or more of a platform than other opposition parties or candidates or organizations that want to be part of the conversation and use social media to do so. So I would say partnerships are important. Our third party fact checking partners are, are highly important. We always increase the number of them, but um, I think to push back on perceptions or accusations of bias, it is important to have an independent organization say that we have verified them, we have worked with them, we have trained them. They are truly independent when they do their fact checking work. And when you read a fact check from that organization, there's rest assured that a process has taken place for them to do the relevant research. And they're not a secret sort of organization supporting the government narrative. So just to, to sort of add more, more um, facts to the conversation about that as well. Thank you, <coughs> Quia. Uh, Emmanuel, do you want to complement that or can I switch to um, audience questions? No, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'll just complement it with uh, just literally two sentences. I think one thing that we shouldn't forget that social media itself, how long has it been in existence? It's quite new, right? So I think these kind of conversations that, uh, that Professor Max described uh, definitely need to happen because it's also a learning process. But I think as it pertains to my engagement on the continent with journalists, for instance, uh, you know, we've been working with different organizations such as Unwell Health Africa, uh, who are actually offering in the healthcare journalist course. And yes, we are supporting this with the donation, but also teaching and showing how Twitter can be used to amplify credible information, right? Because I think oftentimes the conversation, it's uh, when it comes to different regulation conversations, it's often taken in the prism of content removal alone, right? So I think the problem or the issue is much broader than content removal alone. So it's also about how can we encourage amplification of credible information to meet harmful information? And I think this is an approach that we have been taking as well. And, and I really commend Professor Mix for doing the work, but conversation needs to happen. We are quite a new young industry and we are all learning. And I think conversation collaboration definitely needs to happen. And it, on our end, from a trust and safety, uh, from, from trust, from a, um, from a council that we have in place, we have members who are informing us every day how to improve, uh, how to do our work better, and also keeping us accountable. And this is definitely happening, at least in my yeah, end, so in sub Saharan Africa. Don't misunderstand me, um, uh, Emmanuel. And Twitter is one of the best behaved. Uh, you are the most open. You allow researchers to look into your API, <laughs> into all your Absolutely. conversations. Facebook doesn't. Hopefully one day it will, uh, so the conversation continues yeah. indeed. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, no, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, please, uh, Kuya, don't reduce media literacy to risk uh, and, and safety because that is not uh, how we have been developing it in Africa and um, in Europe. And actually there is a very uh, important network um, of uh, media literacy uh, uh, researchers in, uh, in Africa. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to report um, acting in cities. Um, um, but uh, we have also pushed in Europe and in Africa, if I may allow myself now to move to you guys, um, to push via these, uh, the, 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 the media authorities that each of your countries has. Huh? And you have a, a network huh, of uh, these um, uh, media authorities called REARC in French, huh? at least uh, that's how we call it, huh? um, to put in their missions, huh? uh, the missions of these media authorities, media uh, education so that they to use the media also and to educate the population and to it and Africa uh, the, the network of these uh, high authorities on, on media uh, has accepted to do that and some countries are really in the lead like uh, Morocco or like uh, like Tunisia uh, like Kenya so um, uh, and Togo etc so there is a uh, something budding there that for me is very hopeful because media literacy I don't think should be done by you uh, the platforms, uh, you should make it visible and you should make all the resources 
visible, but you are judge and party in this. You're going to criticize the other media and not yourselves. And, there's, and if you don't, even if you don't, there will always be this suspicion. So it's better to remove the suspicion, have it done by NGOs or um, schools or uh, ministries that do these kind of uh, things. Uh, but please give them visibility and don't uh, put them at the bottom of the pile of your algorithms. Which Wait, unfortunately if I may jump, if I may jump in here, so Professor Meggs in, <laughs> Sorry, her, in, her, in her professorial authority has given you decent <laughs> marks, but you could do better basically. You're doing okay, but you could do better. That's your report card from, I think, from Professor I'm Meggs. I'm certainly not but... going to tell them that they're 100% there because they aren't, but they, um, but... as Emmanuel says, we are in a very young process. You're in a very young process, all of us. Okay, so I'm going to now take questions from the audience, which actually link to this discussion, so I'm not going to change the subject. But one of the questions that's been asked is about the importance of partnerships. And I think this is one of the things that's come out of this discussion, which I think very few people understand, is to what extent you're working with um, national media regulators, uh, parliaments, governments, uh, social, civil society. Perhaps you can uh, give a bit more context on how that works. And maybe let's get practical. Uh, maybe a queer, since you, the, you were raising your hands. What does Facebook do before elections? Um, how do you get involved with these different actors? What kind of partnerships do you establish ahead of an election? Yeah, thank you for that question, Sebastian. So when we engage, different teams at Facebook really um, see it as a responsibility to engage with their respective counterparts. So we have, for example, media roundtables where we speak about our election integrity work, how we specifically want to address the risk in regards to a specific election, and then also provide the platform for journalists to open, ask us questions in regards to how certain things work, um, certain concerns that they might have. We do similar work with uh, civil society organizations that I alluded to earlier. We also reach out to the government, oftentimes to our public policy teams, be that um, the relevant Ministry of Communications or the like. Um, and we also work with electoral commissions oftentimes to, but because they're very much interested in voter education efforts and want to use their, pla their platforms in regards to their Facebook presence and to reach young audiences for them to know how to get involved in their respective election. And I, I want to respectfully disagree with my colleague, um, Professor Mix, because I do think it's part of our responsibility to be part of the both online safety and digital literacy conversation, because we are the ones who know how our platforms work best. What I've seen before as a concrete example is the recent um, privacy policy update from WhatsApp. Um, I think there was a lot of miscommunication um, and misunderstanding happening from people. And my mother, as a concrete example, shared a WhatsApp video with me um, from someone completely unrelated to WhatsApp who shared sort of what this would mean if you agreed to this, to this update. The information was completely wrong, right? But somebody had taken the time to put a video together to inform their family and friends about how to keep themselves safe. And I had to tell my mother, mom, please do not share that with your family and friends and the church members because this, this content is incorrect. So I then had to share with her information mm -hmm. that we then had to create, which says, this is actually what will happen if you update your WhatsApp, and this is sort of why we're doing this and, and the reason behind And Nobody can see your information or, or share your data um, when you agree to this. So I think we are partly part of the conversation, but you're completely right. We need to work with NGOs and governments as we are to say, here's the information shared with your stakeholders, translated to local languages, as we have done, for example, in Ghana. Um, on the radio, you would hear tips about how to spot false news, what to look for before you share information, not only in English, but in local languages as well. So I do think that um, our approach is to work with as many people as possible, being cognizant of potential biases or political leanings of different organizations. But I always think the more the merrier when it comes to doing this work, um, especially with so many young people across the continent who've never voted before, and are oftentimes getting engaged because of the stuff they see online. Great, thanks. We actually have we have a fourth speaker on the panel, but he's not visible, so we don't often think of her. But Idayat, are you still there? Yes, please. Okay, uh, maybe you want to react to this, uh, the, the importance of partnerships uh, between tech companies, governments, uh, CSOs, ahead of elections. What, what are your thoughts on that, and how satisfied are you that it's taking place? I think that it's very important um, to note it's true Facebook has actually been doing that, at least in Nigeria since 2015, in terms of training, in terms of engaging. 
But I think it's not also enough. And what they bring to bear, it's not the same as the standards that are actually applicable in Europe and other developed climbs. So they really have to do more. They really have to do more in terms of engagement and in terms of engagement. Now, partnership is very, very key because most of these engagements, if you look at what was used during the 2019 elections, these radio jingles, the platform that was used, quite good, quite okay, but there is actually a better platform that could have actually reached more Nigerians if there has been adequate consultations. Then the ability of this information to trickle to the grassroots remains a challenge. So we talk in terms of IFCN being the basis, forgetting the fact that media groups yeah, can do fact check, put it on their platform. Most Nigerians are not actually on those platforms. They do not have internet access, but there is a thin line between the online and the offline. So other traditional means of circulating this information, aside the importance of translation into local languages, then come into play if other parties are brought on board, aside from the media, the media groups itself then how low can it actually go? So the infodemic, for instance, has shown us the importance of WhatsApp. In Nigeria, and I think across Africa, WhatsApp is the most important platform, followed by Facebook, in terms of engagement. People take the information they get in by WhatsApp, hook, line, and sinker. So you speak to people and they say, oh, I had it on WhatsApp. WhatsApp said, but when there was an opportunity to fast check and trial uh, a WhatsApp app, Nigeria, for instance, being one of the highest users, was not picked as a pilot. Then often than not, when we have conversations like this, there is often the recourse to this question that how many people are actually online in, in Nigeria? How many people are online in, in, in the Gambia? It's so small, the internet penetration is very little, forgetting the fact that there is a thin line between offline and online. And this digital platform now actually determines what even goes into the traditional media. So there okay, is thanks. actually a need to do more. Thanks, Idiot, uh, for Thank that uh, perspective from civil society. So basically, like Professor Meggs, it sounds like um, Idiot says you, you're, you're Doing, you're doing well, but you could do better. Um, <laughs> sorry to put you on the spotlight like this, but I think it's interesting also to see how they're working. Just for the audience, uh, just to, to, to clarify that WhatsApp is owned by Facebook, um, but it's a, it's a private messaging app which is um, encrypted. And so it's mu even harder, much harder to regulate because it's encrypted information. And we've seen in uh, many elections how that's being used to spread sometimes disinformation around elections. And it's very hard to monitor or regulate what goes on on that platform. Do you, Akuya, since you represent Facebook, do you want to say a few words about the growing use of WhatsApp in elections and what your company is trying to do to address it? Sure, I think um, there one can think about the issues there uh, twofold. I think number one, one has to take a step back and, and sort of understand the tension between on the one hand, creating privacy, what people definitely want, and, and that is, ensured by end-to-end -end encryption. But on the other hand, sort of the tension there is the safety aspect that you so rightfully pointed out in terms of how do we tackle misinformation sharing via WhatsApp or the like. I think on the privacy point though, I think it, it's really important that in the context of elections, we again have heard by our partners that they feel safe because they can use WhatsApp and don't have to be afraid that the government is listening on, especially if they're sharing information that is contrary to what the government is saying. And so, so I think it's important to understand that people actually like this platform and use it more often, just as Idiot pointed out, because they can share information and, and don't feel like Big Brother is watching. On the other hand, when it comes to sort of addressing the issue of virality, we WhatsApp as a company has taken the step to address it by making certain product changes. So many of you who, who use WhatsApp will have seen a sort of 
forward share when you get information that has been forwarded to you. Um, but the company even went a step further to say that if a message has been highly forwarded in the past, you yourself could only forward it to either five or if it's highly forwarded only to one person. So we, WhatsApp is the only company who, even though uh, companies benefit from people communicating and sharing, has taken a step to change its product to reduce the ability for people to share information, um, to address this issue of virality. But it has now often been discussed, but again, I think it's important that in this context, um, we can do our part, but the part that also needs to be addressed is making people aware of what are the consequences of sharing information. Because research has shown that oftentimes people know that information is false and they still share it with their family and friends. So I, I think one has to ask why and to better understand that, ask people, you know, you know this information is false, why would you pass it on? And oftentimes people say, just in case it isn't false, I don't want to be the one to not share this vital information with my family and friends. So this, this muscle then of sort of checking for yourself and, and uh, checking different sources or uh, different websites or asking more people about is this true or is this false is a muscle that we still have to build in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think, and globally, to be quite honest. Um, and there again, it's, it's a collective responsibility that people check before they share, before they uh, research, before they share. Um, I have now gotten to the point that my mother will ask me <laughs> before she shares anything she finds on WhatsApp with her family and friends. I'm not <clears> saying anybody should text me and ask, please don't do that. But I do think <laughs> it's something that, you know, we, we have to sort of develop as a society um, and, and that sort of is applicable across all of our platforms, be that Twitter, and Emmanuel, I'm sure will speak to that or, or WhatsApp or Facebook. Thanks, Akuya. So basically, we all know now that um, you should all contact Mrs. Jechi to get the uh, to get the, the the true information. Um, so please. Okay, we we have another question linked again to this question of um, to what extent you cooperate with governments who are trying to draft uh, regulation and laws um, to regulate online space. To what extent you support these initiatives? Um, and to what extent you work with governments, and do you check to what extent those governments are respecting international human rights standards, um, especially around freedoms, uh, when creating this legislation? I mean, this puts you, of course, in a very tricky situation, but tell us uh, how, how you work. Uh, maybe I can just briefly jump in, Sebastian. It's, it's, you know, again, as I pointed out, um, obviously it's always a matter of conversation, um, and other governments, just said, just like in Europe, offer consultations, right? So you can contribute or participate in a consultation where you provide your uh, country's position without being affiliated with anybody or taking size. It's just the, following the legislative and political process to uh, contribute your position, right? So it's not so much siding with the government or agreeing or disagreeing. Uh, for one, we consider ourselves nonpartisan, so we are very neutral. We don't take any sides. But I think for the sake of uh, making our voices heard, but also sharing our values, um, it's, it's really a matter of having a conversation. And this is the extent uh, by which we, we engage. To, to do some explaining, as I shared uh, at the beginning, to do some explaining to actually show that we have certain policies in place that uh, protect speech. So therefore, there's not necessarily a need to introduce this kind of regulation that may actually stifle free speech. And again, to just regularly participate in the regular politi political process, as my colleagues in the EU does with the many consultations that the EU proposes. Uh, yeah, so, so, so pretty much um, this, this is the approach we are taking. And again, we also have different civil society organizations being a member of our Trust and Safety Council. So there's regular conversation, consultation, um, and to providing some contextual knowledge from their side, but even there we don't take any sides. We we just here to hear have your opinion. But obviously we, we hold these values uh, about the importance of free speech very, very dear to our heart. You know, our mission is really to encourage the a healthy public conversation shown all sides as long as they are within the frame of our uh, trade of policies and rules which are, which which support free speech and healthy conversation. Thanks a lot. You had a, a few questions regarding uh, conflict of interest regarding political advertising. Um, 
So especially I think Facebook earns a lot of money from advertising and um, some of it is around elections and, polit and politics. So now you've changed regulations. I don't know if, if people in the audience know this, but there's a suspicion that somehow um, you benefit from a lot of political advertising put out by political parties, politicians, and this therefore uh, skews the, uh, let's say the algorithms or skews the, the objectivity of, your, of what people find online. Maybe you can address that uh, concern, Aquia. Yeah, um, so I would address it by asking people to look up information in regards to our role of, of ads transparency. Um, it's a global rollout and, and the idea of sort of providing ads transparency is that people will be able to see uh, what is organic content on the one hand and what is paid by content from someone. Um, and these sort of uh, product changes we have made allow people to not only understand that and see that very clearly, but also dig deeper and, and understand sort of who's behind the ad, who's, how much money are they spending, who are they targeting, where are the people sitting who, who are being targeted, are they male or female? Um, in addition, the rollout of ads transparency is done to prevent foreign interference in an election. So our requirement is that if you want to advertise in the area of elections or, or social um, political issues, you have to be located in that country. You have to be able to, to showcase that you are sitting in the country, you have an identification from that country, uh, and hence, if you want to run ads, um, that is not coming from a different country trying to interfere or under, undermine that election. Um, we have rollout in, in different countries. Usually, we want to make sure that it happens definitely way before the election, so people have a chance to try out these ads transparency tools. And then most importantly also is that once these um, ads have been run, they stay in an, in an ads library for up to seven years. So you, you can even go back and find out um, who has run an ad, what did they say to maybe women as opposed to what did they say to men. And so I think increasing that transparency is an ability for us to still allow people to run very good ads, which in and of itself are not a bad thing, right? If you have a good campaign that you want to run and you want people to spend money or, or raise awareness or uh, go out for a cause, you want to tell as many people as possible, um, that's a good thing. But we do want to make sure that A, ads do not contravene our community standards. So it's not an ad that spews hate or it's not an ad that sort of tells people to kill someone else. Um, and those checks are always made, number one. And thing number two is if, even if the ad is a good ad, uh, we want to let you know who is behind it and who is paid um, for it um, and for you to be able to to have that information. And it's been quite interesting to see how researchers or or um, just the average average human being who is interested in that topic could go to the ads library and look up sort of who's been saying what to whom, when, and for how much money. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify that ads in and of themselves is, are not a bad thing, but I do think that our response lies in providing more transparency which we have done and we continue to do as well as these um, these launches roll out across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Sebastian, Thanks. maybe yeah. I can also, maybe I can just jump in because of ads, just for the ads aspect and then I'll, I'll just, quickly because just we're, once. We're, we're five, six minutes from the end of it, this session. Go ahead quickly then, Emmanuel. Hopefully, of course, I just wanted to share that Twitter globally prohibits the pro promotion of political content. So we've made yeah. this decision based on our belief that political messages should reach, should be earned and not bought. That that's is all I wanted to jump to uh, to, to throw in. <laughs> it's a good soundbite. Thanks, Emmanuel. Professor Megs, do you want to I address this? To add, um, that this, yeah, because this uh, solution about the access to the archives is due to the code of ethics that we uh, put in place in Europe uh, in 2018. Uh, we uh, we asked for Facebook and Twitter to make it uh, available and, and Google as well. So I'm glad to hear that it has had the Brussels effect and that other countries are taking advantage and other researchers and, and NGOs and that you're playing the game. But definitely, um, uh, the, I think in, so in questions like that that are hugely important societally, um, it means civil society, researchers, observers like us, we have to keep uh, putting because uh, and, and uh, monitoring uh, what is happening because uh, it's not uh, their job at, uh, originally at Facebook and Twitter. They have a commercial business to, to carry. Uh, what uh, the users and these users are remain fundamentally uh, a co-shared responsibility. 
And what I'm hearing and what I'm thinking is happening, you know how at the beginning I said it's mostly self-regulation, regulation at the end. I think what we've heard here is what I'm saying is happening is it's co-regulation. We're coming from different partnerships to, to co-regulate. I wanted to just make, put a little bit, because to justify why I'm here as, as sort of representing Europe, we also have international cooperation. It's not just cooperation of Facebook and Twitter with government, but it's also governments and regions cooperating with each other, which I think is important. Uh, and we learn uh, also from uh, from Africa and from uh, what's happening in other in other places. Uh, but uh, definitely, we are exchanging uh, good practices, uh, uh, country to country, uh, francophone areas with um, francophone areas, anglophone with anglophone, because of course there is uh, the element of language. And uh, um, and I think that uh, this uh, we would need more uh, sort of a regional platforms for exchanges of these practices. And I know that in Tunisia. With funding from uh, the, um, the development fund, the UN Development Fund, and they have created a kind of a, are trying to create a platform like that for fact checkers, um, that is going to recombine hopefully Tunisia check and Africa check, etc., so that they can um, um, raise in um, accountability, in professionalism, in the fact checking uh, uh, efforts and can join the IFCN network, the international one, and, and get more and more um, uh, credible, if you want, uh, in their fact-checking efforts. And that's, that's something that um, is very important and requires training, uh, trainings of journalists, uh, training of um, other kinds of trainers in media literacy, uh, uh, training of adults a lot. Um, so for me, the big uh, battle now is a battle of training. Thank you very much, Professor Meggs. I think no one doubted the relevance of your participation. You've been an extremely informative and insightful uh, contributor to this discussion. I'll take that as the sort of closing remarks on your side, the importance of co-regulation and training and improving media literacy. Perhaps I'll let also the other participants make a few closing remarks quite quickly. Idayat, um, the invisible member, perhaps you want to kick off for the closing remarks, and then we'll, we'll hand the floor to the two tech company representatives. Oh, thank you very much. I think what's very important for Africa will be to start working towards a standardized set of rules on addressing the digital media and, of course, social media, either at the regional level or sub-regional level like ECOWAS and, of course, at the continental level, African, at the African Union. That's very, very important and imperative. Then at the nation's level, actually, it's also important that the electoral heart or the laws that guide election take into cognizance these new ways of engaging on, on of affecting electoral integrity, such as disinformation, influence, oppression. And should, that should go hand in hand with very strong data protection and privacy laws which are, of course, missing in most of our countries. The time is ripe for us to start looking in the way of Europe with everything they are doing, including the GDPR, which has become very, very useful. I also align myself with the importance of training, 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 but also partnership, partnership between groups, um, both in the North and, of course, in the Global South in terms of addressing this and learning best practices, uh, best practices here. But media literacy will be the best way to go in the long run. How do we start teaching children how to identify fake false news, how to refrain from using eight speeches? I think that's the main thing that we really have to grapple with on the continent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Idayat. Um, go ahead, please, uh, Akuya. Do, do you want to make some closing remarks? Sure. Yeah, I think um, this conversation once again has highlighted, uh, just as you have pointed out, the importance of partnerships. And, and I think that's something that um, I, I really value highly. I believe that elections have changed across the world and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And with that, I've seen how, how Facebook has changed in response to that. I think it's not a sort of check mark and, and we're done and we can pack our bags and, and everything is fine. I think it's a continued conversation of how do we keep people safe? How can we keep people informed? 
how can we create platforms where people can make their voices heard and hold their governments accountable but at the same time um yeah being better being more aware of, of sort of what is real what is what is misinformation um what do i do if i come across content that that makes me feel uncomfortable or, or that can exacerbate something bad like like hate speech or or violence um and i've seen facebook in the last couple of years of years make huge investments in in that regard and, and focusing on the safety of its users uh, I believe the company will continue to do so. So we're not at the end. Um, we always say at Facebook, our journey is only 1% done uh, to sort of remind people that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but I love these types of conversations because it's always a good reminder that we have to stay humble and, and sort of listen to people telling us, you're doing well, but you need to do better. <laughs> so this is definitely something I, I'll humbly, um, uh, I'm grateful for and, and take back to my colleagues as well as we, prep for the remaining elections that are taking place across the continent um, for the rest of the year. So thanks for this opportunity and, and for another great conversation about such important topics. Manuel, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll just also just uh, plus one, uh, my colleague Akua, um, you know, every year at, at Twitter is an election. So we do tend to learn from other elections happening all across the globe. And it is really a matter of conversation, uh, partnership in addressing the issue of hate speech, misinformation holistically. And, and I'm happy to continue to do so in partnership with industry peers, but also ac academia um, and institutions like the Kofi Annan Foundation as well. So on that note, I would like so also to extend my thanks to uh, you, Sebastian, and the foundation to facilitate this important discussion, which, um, which needs to happen much more often. And I think also on the co collaboration side that we do need to come together to address this, this issue, uh, not only on the continent, but also beyond the continent, holistically and together. So very happy to continue this engagement and conversations in the future. Thanks, Emmanuel. Yeah, for full disclosure, the Kofi Annan Foundation worked with uh, Facebook and Twitter and others in coming up with its report on protecting electoral integrity in the digital age. And um, both companies proved extremely open to discussion and, and it's been a very, I think, uh, good journey and a number of practical implications and changes have happened as a result of those ongoing conversations. I think that the, the flack you're getting and the, and the pressure that was reflected in this conversation is linked also to the success of your companies um, and the growing role that you've play, you're playing in, in political life um, I think that when you, when tech companies first emerged, they were regulated as private companies, um, but you've grown to play, to become a major public square, uh, a major uh, forum for political debate and discussion. And I think that the regulatory framework in which you were created wasn't well suited to that. And I think we're now trying to, society and the companies and the governments and everyone else is trying to adapt to the huge changes that, um, that the, those practical uh, changes in usage by uh, political parties, candidates, uh, voters have, have uh, Im imply now for our political and democratic life. So I think it's great that we can have these discussions to move mm -hmm. the debate along. And as Professor Meggs has reminded us, um, it's only through uh, pressure and through discussion and debate, um, as in any democratic society, that we reach some kind of working compromise that hopefully works in favor of the public good. Um, in any case, I want to thank you all for having joined this discussion. We're very privileged at the Kofi Annan Foundation to be able to call upon such knowledgeable experts and speaking directly to the companies that are actually shaping the policies that will uh, have a big impact on the way that uh, you participate in political debate going forward. And I want to thank everyone for having joined this discussion from around the world. We will um, put up this video on our social platforms, including Facebook <laughs> and Twitter, so that people who weren't present today can maybe catch up on the discussion later on. And with those remarks, I want to thank you all and wish you uh, a good end of the week. Goodbye, everyone. Keep up the good work. Bye. Bye. Please stay online.